Good, good afternoon, morning or evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Robin Green, Chair of Research Libraries UK, and I'd like to welcome you to the RL UK Digital Shift Forum. This is our first event in this monthly series. Thank you for joining us. The forum is one of the key deliverables from RL UK's Digital Shift Manifesto, which was launched in May 2020 and can be found on the RL UK website. The manifesto provides a 10 year vision for the research library in relation to the digital shift occurring within its collections, operations, services and audiences. It outlines the skills, the spaces, the infrastructure and the partnerships required to achieve this vision. Since its launch, members of RL UK's Digital Shift Working Group and various member networks have been busy implementing the manifesto's delivery plan. And this has un included uh, unexpected elements such as RL UK's research into COVID-19 and how this is having an impact on the digital shift. And this work was published on the RL UK website in July. One of the manifesto's key ambitions is to bring together colleagues from across the information, cultural and research communities to explore the nature and impact of the digital shift occurring amongst research library collections, services and, its, and audiences. This work draws on the convening power of RL UK, combined with the Digital Shift Forum's mantra that you're seeing of convene, discuss, collaborate. And we'll then ensure the fruits of this work are shared widely to stimulate further service development. So the forum is specifically designed as a cross-sector, interdisciplinary and global space, a place to make connections and identify through discussion and debate tangible actions that we might take as a community. I hope you'll engage in this with us over the coming months and to persuade you to do so, a few words about our forthcoming programme. We have seven excellent speakers scheduled for this series, running at pace from now until April 2021. They come across from the research, information and cultural sectors and bring perspectives from both within and beyond the research library community. And just to warn you that the format of the sessions will be presentations and discussions like today, but will also include in conversation pieces and book club formats. We want to connect with you through events that are part conference, part book club, part coffee shop chat. And next in the series on the 18th of November is Claire Warwick, Professor of Digital Humanities at the University of Durham in the UK, who will speak on the digital dystopia. Uh, to sign up for this and other sessions, and I thoroughly encourage you to do so, go to the Digital Shift section of the RL UK website. So, on to housekeeping, and a few housekeeping points for today. The session will be recorded and will later be made openly available on the RL UK website. If you've got questions on the presentation, please submit these through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Do submit them throughout Lockham's talk. Don't feel that you've got to wait till the end. And if you want to share thoughts on Twitter, use hashtag RLUKDSF. You can also make comments in the chat box, but please only put questions in the Q&A box. And lastly, OCLC will ask for your input during the session in the form of a short poll on your perspectives on COVID and collections. Do go to the poll and complete it when the time comes, as Lockham will discuss the results during the, his talk. And who could be more fitting to launch our forum and its series of thought pieces than Lorcan Dempsey, OCLC Vice President and Chief Strategist. Today's audience will, I'm sure, be very familiar with Lorcan's work and the influence he's had on library development over the years. I particularly admire how he identifies and captures for us sectoral large-scale canvases and directions of travel. His work enables us, me, to figure out how to place the jigsaw pieces of our library services into these contexts. 
And he's also got an uncanny ability to encapsulate these simply and powerfully in phrases such as the inside out library and the collective collection, phrases that then become part of our professional canon. His most recent blog post interweaves current collection directions, the COVID pandemic, and the implications of the acceleration of the shift to digital that we're experiencing. And in his talk today, Lorcan will explore and extend these themes, looking at how libraries are optimizing and pluralizing their collections to meet local and wider community contexts. He'll also touch on how different at scale systemic characteristics influence developments using as an example differences between the UK and the US. So I'll now hand over to Lorcan and he'll take questions after the presentation. So do please submit these as we go through. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Robin, for that uh, kind uh, introduction. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be here, very pleased to inaugurate uh, this series and uh, uh, just wish it could be uh, in, in person. Um, as Robin said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about a, a variety of uh, collection directions or uh, reflections uh, that I've been talking about for a, a little while, um, but also talk about how they have been uh, accelerated uh, by uh, the pandemic. One of the impacts of the pandemic across uh, all that we do, I think, is that uh, many trends are accelerated. It's as if uh, 10 years of development are suddenly happening in, in one year. If you think about what's happening in healthcare, if you think about what's happening in education, if you think about what's happening in retail, we're seeing this acceleration uh, of trends that were already underway. And I think the same thing is certainly happening in libraries and it is happening in relation to some of these trends that uh, I have uh, been um, talking about. So uh, thank you again. Uh, very pleased to be here and I will uh, jump in. Uh, I'm going to say uh, very little about uh, UK-US contract uh, contrast and then uh, talk uh, in various ways uh, about uh, collections uh, as, we, uh, as we move along. Um, I, it's it's uh, quite often difficult to sort of think about uh, how one is different from somewhere else if you are inside. Stepping back and looking at it from the outside, you, you get qu quite a different perspective because you, you step outside your normal way of doing things. You see, as it were, what the label is on your own um, jar. But I think if you look at similarities between the UK and the US, um, one of the things that is quite striking is that the educational system is quite stratified uh, in each uh, country. If you think about comparing the US with Canada, or you think about comparing uh, the UK with Ireland or with the Netherlands on, on either side, you'll see that in each case, uh, the US and the UK are more stratified than uh, their neighbors, that there is a uh, prestige uh, ranking. Um, uh, there is a, a sense of um, uh, research uh, excellence concentrating in, in, in certain areas. And so this is um, very much a feature of both um, the UK and the US higher education system. And clearly you can see the way in which research funding is distributed as well following uh, certain uh, patterns. And obviously RLUK concentrates to some extent the um, uh, institutions uh, within a UK context who um, uh, have that uh, research uh, focus. I think uh, over the next few years, both in the uh, US and in the UK, and there's quite an active discussion in the US, um, the, the way this plays in terms of uh, social equity, given the uh, sort of role of education in social mobility, but the extent to which the stratification is um, potentially supporting uh, or not supporting uh, social equity, I think becomes a uh, very uh, important uh, topic. Um, one factor of the stratification is this specialization. Um, 
the uh, way in which research is concentrated in uh, particular uh, universities and as I say supported by the, the flow of funding but that also means I think that you do see a very clear sense that you have research universities that focus on learning, uh, student retention, student success, very important, but also concentrate a lot of research activity and are very focused on research support from the point of view of the library. Really uh, important discussion about research data management, a variety of other things, but very clear um, specialization there. If you think about some differences, um, Really, um, thinking about the national context, you have a high degree of centralization in the UK, as you do in a variety of uh, European and other countries. Um, the US is very decentralized. So, um, thinking about a UK context, you, you have uh, uh, a big focus uh, public education. So, I think people in the US are occasionally surprised to discover that Oxford in Cambridge are public universities that participate in the same overall regulatory framework as uh, all of the uh, other universities in, in the uh, UK. They're subject to the same uh, funding and uh, uh, assessment uh, uh, regimes. And you have things like the REF at a national level that has a systemic influence within the way in which things are done in a UK context. You have agencies that operate at a national level to um, uh, provide services, to increase capacity, to increase efficiency, to increase impact um, through some pooling uh, of effort. You turn to a US environment and really the situation is very decentralized. Uh, you don't tend to have national level uh, agencies in that way. You have a really um, a hugely diverse uh, educational system um, um, and uh, quite a lot of uh, decentralization. You have a mix of public and private institutions, uh, meaning um, um, that, uh, that there are different uh, focuses there. You have quite a bit of state concentration. Um, you know, you have state systems, you have state support and so on. But I, I think uh, that decentralization is very much part of the feature. And, and that is one reason why consortia in a library context are so important, because if you don't have that sort of shared infrastructure coming from public sources, then uh, libraries or universities come together to do things for themselves. So the consortium is really a central part uh, of library operations in the US context. And, libraries will tend to belong, in fact, to uh, several uh, consortia and get a lot of their collaborative work done through consortia. Now, clearly, in a UK context, various other contexts, you have, a, you have something of a mix. But nevertheless, that reliance, uh, that importance of the uh, centralized uh, public um, provision, quite important. Now, clearly, just from a governance point of view, from a structural point of view, is moving. In, in a particular direction and um, has more of a membership element. But nevertheless, really, really quite interesting uh, to see uh, that difference. And I think historically it's a feature of the UK that originally the British Library, especially through uh, the Document Supply Centre, um, but then also JISC ha has tended to uh, mean that you haven't seen the, the development of those consortia in the same way because to some extent there hasn't been a need because you, you have that national provision. So I think um, uh, really quite an important uh, distinction when you come to talk about uh, services and uh, development. Okay, so I'm going to say a little bit about uh, pandemic uh, effects. Um, uh, um, at the moment, uh, people are very much plunged into uh, planning. They're very much plunged into um, uh, figuring out how to open safely, um, how to do things in a very difficult time. And certainly at OCLC, we're very aware of this um, uh, through our interaction with libraries and our services, but also through Project Realm, uh, where we have been working with IMLS in the US and Battelle looking at uh, the virus and persistence on, on materials and, and, and really immersed in, in the whole uh, safety discussion. 
What I want to do is to say that as we look beyond the horizon, wherever the horizon is, um, what are two or three things that will really emerge as important um, drivers? This, uh, speaking of driving, this is the uh, this is a bridge between the U.S. and uh, um, Canada, and this is the picture that I took um, before the uh, pandemic. Of course, I couldn't make this journey now because um, I can't actually uh, go to Canada. So I'm thinking of three uh, pandemic effects. The first is clearly the uh, shift online and I think if we think about retail, if we think about health, we're seeing this general, if we think about entertainment, we're seeing this general shift uh, online and I think uh, clearly things will change again but we're not going to get all of the toothpaste back in the tube. Various changes that have happened are, are going to continue and we talk about a shift online but I think the, the, what this means is that we really have to think about what does a holistic online library experience mean. It doesn't mean just moving stuff online, it means that how do you create something that reflects the full presence, the full capacity, the full offering of the library in an online environment. The second thing is uh, mission. That really this will bring about, and, and clearly libraries are already focused on the mission of their organization, but I think this will really double down on that in terms of creating a sharp focus on alignment with evolving uh, institutional uh, priorities. As institutions figure out where they are going, what they are doing, what their emphasis is in this uh, environment. And third and related to that is a big focus on optimizing. It will be an imperative to optimize against particular goals. Um, this will be because there will be downward pressure on budget, um, but there will be a rolling strategy, thinking about how to react, what to do, how to position in the context of a world uh, that has changed. And also, uh, as we have seen the uh, awakening, the reckoning in relation to uh, uh, racial equity, really a strong focus on pluralizing, pluralizing uh, libraries, pluralizing collections, pluralizing uh, perspectives. So this has come uh, in uh, to the mix and very much uh, thinking about how to uh, optimize against particular goals. So certainly online, on mission, and then optimize. Historically, uh, within um, a, a UK context, um, the hybrid library was, was a concept that, that emerged um, uh, 20 years ago or so in terms of thinking about uh, uh, that digital shift, an earlier part of the digital shift, and thinking that you, know, you, you have a hybrid uh, uh, experience, you have a hybrid library that combines digital and um, um, physical. Now, with a hybrid library, though, uh, it, it's interesting how um, when we hear people talk about the library on campus or elsewhere, quite often there's this sort of confusion between well, there's the library as a building, there's the library as a service, there's the library as a set of people. And if you think about the value of the library, what value the library provides, the identity of the library, uh, the workflows that people engage in, all of those things in the hybrid environment tend to be a, a little bit blurred because, because people don't have that single library story that brings together the range of online services, the new capacities, as well as this still quite strong sense of the library as a physical place with books and wood in it. And I, I think um, uh, this uh, is a picture I took a couple of years ago of a, a a library that uh, many of you will be, be familiar with in uh, Trinity College Dublin, now of course a tourist uh, venue. And um, interestingly, if, if when you see a stock photograph of a library, it seems to me about 50% of the time it's this library. When US News um, you know, sort of uh, has a picture of a library when um, you know, the New York Times has a picture of a library. Quite often, it, it, it is this library. So that sense of the image of the library, you know, is still quite strong, even though we've moved beyond it. And I think when we talk about a hybrid library, 
It's as if we have these signposts going to different aspects of the library, and, and they don't sort of come together into this holistic single story, this holistic single presence, this holistic single experience in the context of um, uh, users' uh, lives. And I think one of the ramifications of the pandemic, and especially depending on, on how long it lasts, is that recognition maybe of the library as a service that has an identity and a presence, and the link to the library building is, is severed a little bit, or the library building as part of the identity of the library clearly is there, but it's just one part of this overall library experience, which now is being experienced online. So I think that acceleration of the library into its online uh, manifestation and the sense uh, that it is, is a service in, in your life maybe uh, will be uh, accelerated. And I think this means that what we're doing, what we're looking at is how do you deliver the full library experience online? Now you can't deliver the full library experience online in terms of social spaces, various other things, but you can deliver certainly more. And there's a challenge in terms of thinking about some of the areas. So uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but things like consultation and expertise, so much a part of the library. How do you think about that in a, an on, online environment. If you think about the very strong relational element of the library, that you make relationships with people and then you begin to develop services, very important in evolving areas like research support. You build the relationships, you build the services to follow. How do you recreate that sort of re relational um, element? And then you have more uh, obvious or clear things like how do you deliver efficiently into the learning process, into the uh, VLE into uh, learning management. Uh, big focus in public libraries now on personal connection, uh, looking at customer relationship management systems, looking at ways of uh, profiling users and connecting to them. So really thinking about in an online environment, how do you deliver services, certainly, and they're still a little bit clunky, we have to do work to integrate them, but then also, how do you deliver the expertise of the library? How do you develop that relational element that is so important? So these things are all really going to come to, to the fore. And I think I put up the note about public libraries because I think that personal connection, that customer relationship management system that many public libraries have installed, those things really emphasized in, in this environment. So if you think about the current online presence of uh, the library, I think what we've seen over the last while is something of a move from full collection discovery, where there was a big focus on discovery uh, as bringing together all aspects of the collection, to thinking about full library discovery. How do I make uh, uh, what's available in the library available? And I, and I quite like the way um, uh, Michigan uh, has done this. If you look at this, this is their uh, discovery service. They have this bento box arrangement, you know, um, different uh, boxes for uh, different strands of results. And they have staff librarians in the middle. You do a search and they try and match the librarian uh, to that search. And, and this is now um, deployed in a, in a variety of places. But it's sort of moving along towards full library discovery that you can search the website, you can, you can find events, you can search resource guides, you can do various things, not just um, the collection. So this is, if you like, is a move in, in, in this direction. But it's only a, a partial move. And if you think about library websites, they still have that hybrid nature. They still, they, they signpost to different places and they're pointers, they're sets of pointers rather than this uh, full experience. Now, I've put up a few screenshots from Michigan because I think the Michigan Library website, which was newly developed uh, recently, is a very good example of where uh, things uh, are going, of where uh, they go. I think they've done a very good job of actually trying to develop a more holistic view of what the library has to offer and delivering it online in a way uh, that makes sense, in a way that doesn't signpost somewhere else and, and um, drop you off. So here's the uh, homepage. 
And I think what we're seeing here in the terms that I was using a moment ago is that the hybrid library website, the library website that's a series of signposts, that's a set of services, that's a, a set of opening times, it's sort of moving towards this website gives you the full library experience. And yes, you, you have space here, but you know, that it tells you about that. But this is the full library experience. And we will try and present to you uh, as much as we can, everything that you can um, do here. So it's, it's much fuller, it's quite deep. Um, and the way they do things is under each section, they say, so find, borrow, request. You can find on the left-hand side, you have the set of headings, find materials, borrow and return, request items for pickup, um, request digital copies, use course reserves. So actually quite nicely arranged, the set of things that people might expect under find borrow request. So it's not just a link to the ILL, it's not just a link to something else. And then under each of these, you can drill down further. So find materials by type, um, books in various formats, articles. So they're actually doing a lot more work to expand and explain what is in the library to build a uh, context to guide uh, the user around. So similarly, uh, under visit and study, it's not just here are our spaces, here is when they're open. They're talking about creation and learning spaces, uh, cafes and well-being, computing and technology, events and exhibits, floor plans. Um, so, and under each of these, they, they drill down. So what they're trying to do, as with some retail sites, but, but you know, I, I don't think we need to look there for comparison. I think what they're doing here is saying, how do I deliver more of that library experience more? How do I create a, a holistic uh, library experience? Research, help with research. So instruction and course design, creation design, digital projects and planning, data services. And then under each of these, you can drill down. Now, all of our library websites have some of these things, but I think what they've done here is really fill that out, and it's a, it's a very nice uh, example. Collections, I think, is quite interesting in the context of what I'm going to say later. They have collecting areas, so these are the areas they collect in, in the collection, but then they talk about their digital collections. Deep blue repositories, they talk about their repository for preprints for research data. They talk about their publishing services. And then uh, Michigan is the home of HashiTrust, but they, they signal uh, HashiTrust uh, here. So again, a much more rounded view of what they do and the ability to navigate and, and move uh, more deeply in. About the library, again, a, a full accounting. So I think what Michigan has done is actually show quite a nice example of a more holistic uh, library experience online. And I think it, it is, in fact, a, a, a very interesting and well done uh, library website. But it flags or signals how uh, we're going to move to much more full description, much more uh, full signposting, much more uh, full uh, guidance, as well then as connection to expertise and over time connection back to those um, spaces. So I think we'll see a, a shift from this sort of more hybrid arrangement where you have a set of signposts to different services and so on to a much more holistic view that this is the full range of what the library does. This is um, um, you, you, a picture and a story of how the library helps you get your work done and um, um, pulling all of that um, together in a, in a more um, holistic way. Now, I'm conscious that you know, we're talking about the shift to digital, and I think the shift to digital happens in this context, but alongside a shift to digital, alongside greater reliance on digital services, I think the library really has to think about how does it present this holistic library service in an environment where the interaction with the library is uh, online. Now, I think this will accelerate the view that that full library uh, experience has to be provided. On mission, I think this is um, clear. I, I put this uh, uh, up from um, uh, Nick Hillman, a uh, uh, commentator on, on higher education many of you will be familiar with. 
Um, but he does, I, I just thought, you know, when asked to expound on the full impact, it's too early to say, um, which is very true. And also, as he points out, we're drowned in commentary about, you know, the impact of the pandemic, what's going to happen, where are things going to go? Um, and I'm doing a bit of it now. But the, the um, message here, though, is that we are drowned in commentary. It is too early to say, but it is clear that institutions are going to have to sort of figure out what their focus is, how they are going to uh, address these issues. And from a library point of view, this really means focusing uh, on where the institution is focused. And I think this means we will see a complete transition. We will, we will complete the transition from the more collection-based library, uh, where some of the identity, value, workflow of the library was bound up with the space and the collection. And, and this transition obviously is well underway to seeing collections as a service. Collections are one service among many others. Collections are a way of satisfying needs and they don't necessarily have to all reside in one place. Um, to really thinking about how you support the learning, the research, and the engagement agenda of the institution. And, and depending on the type of institution, the balance uh, between these uh, will change. So uh, these are all familiar to you about you know, student success and retention, advancing research productivity. Uh, interesting element in terms of research infrastructure, that workflow is the new content, almost thinking about how um, um, uh, research um, uh, systems, research workflow, and so on have become much more important. One thing that I, I call out here is I've, I've called it under education, critical research and media discrimination. I think one thing that the library needs to do, and we're very aware of this at the moment in the US, thinking about the election, um, is thinking about um, the structure of scholarship, but really the complicated information environment that we're now in, where you have algorithmic um, um, uh, you know, systems that really are um, driven by algorithms, driven by uh, preferences, we have this contested and confused sometimes media environment. We have increased polarization and partiality that's sort of creeping in in various ways into um, um, uh, all aspects of, of our lives. So that sense of, you know, wh where you, you may once have had bibliographic instruction, which was related to the collection, moved to digital literacy, which was more broadly related, now moving to this sense of you know critical research or media discrimination, the ability to navigate a really complex information environment, and I think that mirrors, if you like, some of the other changes in terms of the location of the of the library. So, uh, the third element, optimize. Clearly, libraries will have to optimize in terms of thinking about um, the online learning environment, but also a whole variety of other things. So. Um, it depends the strategic choices that need to meet uh, particular goals of the institution. So from a library point of view, as online learning becomes more important, this means how do I increase the visibility of library resources in the VLE or the LMS? Um, some obvious places here. Um, are my, uh, can I make interactive resources available in the VLE, um, thinking about the LTI protocol and so on? Can I embed library expertise in the uh, VLE? Um, can I think about space? You know, how do I think about responsible management of space in the pandemic, telling people what is available, how to behave, what to do? And then we have a whole question about the future of shared space. But these, uh, questions obviously become uh, very important. Also then in terms of collections, thinking about uh, optimizing collections, and you can optimize collections in a variety of ways. There's a value question, there's an open question, certain, and certainly this is a very big issue in, you know, in, in, in the RLUK agenda, various other agendas, but then there's curricular support in the context of the learning agenda. Uh, regional or local, um, uh, quite important in, in some contexts where the, the, there's some collaboration or there's a desire to reflect some, some particular issues, collaboration, um, and then, as I say, diversification, pluralizing. So uh, we thought here it might be nice to do a poll to see um, 
Um, which of these were most important as libraries are beginning to think about optimizing collections in the context of the current environment? And, um, uh, you know, th there are trade-offs here, which I'll come back to. So I'm going to pass to my uh, colleague, uh, Marilee Prophet, who is uh, managing the poll uh, activity. You're muted, Marilee. It just wouldn't be a webinar if somebody didn't have to unmute. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today and for taking our poll. Um, if you're not already there, go to pollev.com slash OCLC. And you can see here um, the poll results uh, rolling in um, along those lines that Lorcan outlined. You can choose as many of these as you wish, but please choose the ones that you feel are most important for optimizing collections. Um, and we can see here there's kind of a, a horse race, a continuing horse race between openness and support for curriculum uh, being the most important um, things uh, for a while there. I was watching the uh, openness clearly lead, but as more people take the poll, those things are kind of evening out. Um, and then uh, value for money also right up at the top. Um, uh, collaborative decision making and plural voices as experience kind of coming up as uh, secondary um, concerns to those to those top three and a regional yeah. and uh, kind of coming in as fourth. Lorcan, your comments on this? Yeah, I mean, I think this is quite interesting as Marilee points out. I mean, you've got sort of uh, two, two groups. Um, uh, the top three and then the um, two coming up after after that. So that, that's really quite interesting. We've done this within a couple of uh, consortia within the US and I think value for money figured much more strongly there than it has here. Openness perhaps less strongly. So I think uh, what I take away from this is the big focus on support for learning, which I think is general. Uh, value for money may be stronger in some cases. Uh, I think it was certainly stronger in some of the consortia we looked at. And then openness maybe, um, I, I think the strong result here reflects the very strong emphasis on um, open access, open science uh, through various of the national and library and RLUK, JISC and other discussions uh, of late, but certainly uh, seems to be stronger than in some of the uh, consortia that we did. I would also say, I think, and Marilee may, may correct me if, if I'm wrong here, I think the plural voices, the diversification is perhaps um, not as much of an emphasis here as it was in a couple of our US consortia. I think the impact of Black Lives Matter, the impact of um, the um, whole uh, reckoning uh, that people recognize is overdue has, has been stronger than, than uh, that these numbers reflect here. Um, so I would say open is stronger here, um, value for money a bit weaker, and plural voice is a bit weaker. If you, if you look at a comparison, um, I think in general, um, this is probably um, not very surprising, does reflect the strong commitment to open. Yeah. Okay. That was interesting. Let's keep moving. Yeah, so we can um, we can come back to this later if it's of interest. Uh, but I'll turn it back to you, Lorcan. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for that, Marilee. Uh, that worked quite smoothly. Okay. So uh, having talked a bit about pandemic effects, I'll I'll, I'll quickly talk a bit about um, uh, collections. Uh, three areas, and Robin mentioned a couple of these: collector, collective collections, facilitated, and inside out. So we've seen very much uh, the rise of the collective collection, increasingly organizing collections at the network or uh, system-wide uh, level. I, I keep meaning to crop that photograph on the left. I took it and I, I, I keep meaning to crop it to remove the head. <laughs> I, I, I haven't done that though. Um, so collective collection, um, I, I think uh, we are seeing, certainly in the US context, uh, some acceleration here because there's a growing recognition that the print collection is very much something that has to be uh, managed um, more collectively, um, maybe at a consortium level, because 
um, uh, of the move to online, but also uh, because of the growing recognition of the opportunity cost of those uh, print collections in terms of space, um, but also just because of the efficiency, wanting to do certain things with uh, the print collection in, in, bigger, uh, in bigger groups. And you know, we've done a lot of work on this uh, recently. Uh, you may not be able to see, but I, I pulled up uh, just a little clip from the uh, digital shift uh, document. And uh, this is under collections, and I've just chopped it to show that the first three have networked collabor uh, collaboration or collaborative uh, collective. So uh, a, a strong focus in the digital shift on um, thinking about how to manage uh, collections, especially in a digital context, but also uh, thinking about that print collection in the context of the collective, in the context of collaboration. What this means, of course, is there's always this tension between autonomy and consolidation. You know, the uh, autonomy, individual libraries do things together themselves, and what happens in a consolidated um, way. Now, I think this is an area where the dynamic I suggested at the beginning is very strong, because in a UK context, the move to consolidation is facilitated by national infrastructures. So, just collections can do work on behalf of the whole country in that consolidated uh, national way. Some other areas, if you think about print collections, may be more difficult to move along this uh, consolidation um, line. But there's always a, um, a trade-off between autonomy and consolidation. What do you do locally? What do you do? Uh, what do you continue to focus on? What's important to have? This is a dynamic that is really, really very strong in consortia. Consortia have this continual discussion about, you know, what happens at the local level, what do they do at the consortial level, what, because it involves giving things, giving things up. One of the things that has emerged as an important future area is what we would have called collaborative collection development thinking about optimizing collections at the system level rather than at the individual uh, library level. And you know, uh, so prospective collection coordination is what uh, we're calling it in certain contexts. Thinking about coordinating collections prospectively so that you can manage a particular subject or a manager. And that's really very difficult to do because you have this um, uh, multiple actor um, uh, issue that you, know, you, you have to sacrifice local autonomy um, for a uh, shared gain, but it's very difficult to say to faculty or it's very difficult to say to people about their budget, you know, we're going to give up um, some local autonomy in favor. So really quite difficult moving along the spectrum. And it's one of the places where I think um, the, the sort of a national attention in the UK context uh, is, uh, is, is, is an advantage in that um, uh, things can be uh, done. There's agency. At, the, at that national level, uh, you know the disadvantage is that you know things things uh, may move uh, more slowly or or um, stay there. So a variety of questions though come up then in relation to collective uh, collections. We focus largely on print collections because of the desire to move them together. But of course, we manage all sorts of collections now collectively, and certainly licensed collections, as I suggested a moment ago, very consolidated in certain contexts uh, from the point of view of negotiation and so on. And clearly, we're in a pivotal moment here in scholarly communication from a licensing point of view where there are multiple paths to the future. And it's... Um, um, <clears throat> quite difficult even just to track the variety of uh, approaches, uh, policies, um, um, uh, positions um, that, that, are, that are there. And, and this is a uh, very much uh, uh, a movement in the context of, of a bigger um, uh, set of uh, activities. I mean, one of the reasons it's so difficult is to some extent, the Academy historically outsourced reputation management to publishers who are now increasingly consolidated um, in uh, larger uh, commercial uh, entities. Um, so because reputation management is so crucial to the Academy, because that reliance on impact factors, citations, prestige journals, so important, um, uh, very difficult um, 
to shift this, and an awful lot uh, involved uh, uh, in this. Uh, publishers clearly diversifying, looking at analytics and workflow. Um, in the discussion, you, you see multiple com competing viewpoints. I mean, clearly, you know, from maybe a university point of view, from a funder point of view, there's a, there's a view of the system as a rational, uh, as a system that, that you know, you, you can maybe design as a rational design, it should work better, do it top down. Publishers very much see it as a, as a market, and it's, it's, it's subject to, to certain market forces, not a, not a, not a perfect market because of uh, the way in which publishing works, but nevertheless, we'll see things in terms of business incentives and so on. So really quite interesting seeing, seeing some of these discussions on the different interests uh, around the table that don't always quite uh, see where they're going. Institutional, national, international funding policy agents at play. And then uh, what is happening in the pandemic is acceleration of desire for open and open science. So all of that means that there's this very complicated um, discussion going on where that national coordination detention is, is uh, quite helpful. From a, uh, a monograph uh, print uh, point of view, beginning to think about what it actually means to operationalize the collective collection. So certainly in the US we're seeing quite a bit of attention to shared print. What's the optimal distribution of shared print? How do you organize uh, groups, consortia, others to do it? Co coordinate digitization plans in the context of um, um, overlap, uh, rarity, and so on. And as I said a moment ago, prospective collection coordination. How do you move towards sort of thinking about optimizing at the system level? Um, as more uh, e-books emerge, as people license more books, then um, you know, issues that you're all probably very familiar with. Do you develop group license to permit the sharing of e-books? a lot more expensive, you know, what's the, what's the balance, and a much stronger interest in uh, evidence-based acquisition, uh, demand-driven acquisition. Um, and that, that's a sort of strange flip. Um, um, you know, we're used to historically when collection was dominant, having the collection drive discovery. And in, in, a, in a sort of strange way now, discovery drives the collection. What people can find um, drives what's, uh, what's available to them or what's in the collection. The relationship between existing print stores, uh, sharing of those, digitization, um, uh, what you get as ebooks or not ebooks, um, uh, what you acquire, what you borrow, all of this underlines the need for greater uh, decision uh, support. Um, which uh, means that there are actually some, some quite naughty um, um, policy questions. Uh, if you think about collective collection from a monograph or a print point, point of view, what responsibility does RLUK as an entity, the RLUK members, going back to what I said about the stratification and the research uh, element that's um, represented there, what responsibility do RLUK members collectively take for the print scholarly record? And emerging for the published digital scholarly record, the e-books that, that, that might be replacing many of those print uh, so I think, you know, in a UK context, does RLUK Act, does JISC Act, does whatever, the British Library centrally involved, but is there a sense, is there a, a sense that's translated into some operational view of a responsibility for that scholarly record that, uh, as I say, ramifies through actual choices and through systems that are put in place to ensure that? <laughs> We're seeing this uh, discussion around rights, reevaluating, thinking about where uh, lines are, what's permissible, control digital lending, really pushing on this uh, in, in important ways and as a major discussion for individual libraries and for library organizations. And I think the pandemic is accelerating that. And then, you know, the same uh, in relation to course materials and so on. As we move online, as we think about doing things differently, we're having this re-evaluation uh, discussion and control digital lending is really pushing that as are in a, in a different way um, course materials. And then the scalar question, consolidation at what level? The agency, the budget, the service. Um, do people do things in a White Rose consortium? Do they do things in RLUK? Do they, do they uh, lobby for national attention? And I think 
as uh, certain questions come to the fore, then the question about agency does uh, as well. <clears throat> I put this up quickly. We've done some work recently with the Big Ten Academic Alliance, um, large Midwestern universities, major research powerhouse, more research money in the Big Ten Academic Alliance than there are in Ivy Plus and University of California together. Collectively, they manage about a quarter of the titles in uh, uh, print titles in North America. We did a report about collective collection, operationalizing collective collection. They are now trying to operationalize that. They're looking at what it means to actually bring those major print collections into shared management. So uh, I recommend having a look at some of the material there. <coughs> Facilitated uh, collection. You want to assemble a coordinated mix of local, external, and collaborative services around user needs. <coughs> So we very much moved from an owned collection to a facilitated collection. Um, we began by borrowing things, then we licensed things. Now, as I say, uh, things are demand driven. Then there's a range of sharing. There was a shared print collection, shared digital collection. Now we have shared scholarly outputs. And then behind all of this, the fact that we're pointing to resources that are available elsewhere, pointing researchers at Google Scholar, including freely available eBooks, providing access to open access, open educational resources, creating resource guides. So in fact, a large part of what the library does in relation to collections has moved to the facilitated end. Clearly, people have large special collections, large specialized collections, large owned, managed, um, uh, acquired collections. But, but there is this um, um, shift, which is uh, quite interesting. And what this means is that really the library has a new relationship to collections. At one stage, there was a careful construction of a locally acquired collection. Now people want to optimally satisfy research and learning needs from a facilitated network. Open access has become more important. Demand-driven has become more important. Guided access to stuff elsewhere has become more important. And collaborative approaches have become more important. So all of these things prize the collection away from, from that, peel the collection away from being that locally acquired, carefully constructed collection, which is still a central part of what libraries do. But at the same time, they're now trying to optimally satisfy research and learning needs from this facilitated network. And as I say, each of these areas is being accelerated, open access, demand-driven, guided, and collaborative. Um, <clears throat> Inside out collection, you want to create, manage, and make discoverable evidence, community memory, the capacities, the resources of your institution, the research outputs, the special collections. <clears throat> and this has clearly become more important in a pandemic sense. Research libraries will have to more purposefully partner to curate, manage, and make more discoverable research outputs like preprints and research data. As research itself is changing in, uh, as a result of uh, pandemic effects, uh, acceleration of research, uh, thinking about the peer review process, thinking about open, thinking about collaboration, really uh, major impacts on research. Now, it doesn't mean everything is upended. It means certain things are being um, accelerated. <clears throat> and you're all familiar with um, these types of services that, that um, you know, so uh, uh, expert systems, um, expertise systems, profiling systems, discoverability of university research outputs and expertise becoming more important, will become more important, libraries variably involved in those. But then really thinking about from this holistic point of view, thinking about inside out library collections, thinking about what is available within the institution and making that available in more structured ways. This is our Purdue library and I quite like the way they've done it. They've got a range of um, um, sort of um, cultural heritage, uh, special collections type things. They've got some um, digital scholarship type outputs. Then on the bottom line, they've got um, campus publishing initiative. They've got um, the um, um, archives, special collections. They've got their institutional repository, and they've got uh, research data management. So here, what you're seeing is 
a way of uh, signaling, and I, I, I like the way it's all brought together in the one uh, part of the screen, a whole range of collections, uh, special collections, uh, digital scholarship uh, from Purdue, uh, local publishing initiatives, the repository, uh, records management, um, uh, research data management uh, brought together and, and being shared with the, with the world. What this means, obviously, and this is a report we've just done on social interoperability on campus, that you are in discussion with all of these other stakeholders on campus around the nature of research support and where that goes. Okay, so uh, three collection directions accelerated, and finally, uh, very quickly, two imperatives that are now um, emerging. First, to return to optimizing, libraries have focused on building, managing, and sharing collections. Greater attention is now turning to optimizing collections locally and across groups, and this is part of the general uh, optimization I mentioned earlier. So I, I sort of outlined some areas, and we did the poll on places where um, there's going to be greater emphasis. But clearly, that involves you know a need for more decision support, but also involves trade-offs. If you think about moving online very quickly, there's a temptation just to buy lots of packages, to buy in lots of things, and there's a sort of trade-off between that and openness. If you think about uh, putting more focus on inside-out collections, you know, you're probably going to take some resource away from uh, more acquired collections. So, um, you know, there's, there, there are um, trade-offs to be made here and decisions to be made here. Um, I was quite interested in this. Uh, Penn State University put up a, a note saying that they're having to reduce um, investment in collections, and these are the things that they're looking at. But if you like, these are also the areas that you're thinking about optimizing against, and there's, there's trade-offs. Uh, so they're certainly focusing on what's, uh, you, what you need for coursework, they're focusing on electronic, they're removing duplication, which of course many libraries will have done already, they're uh, looking at usage data, they're looking at diversity or pluralization, um, they're looking at collaboration, um, and of course, open access. So, you know, all of these things where increasingly people want to uh, optimize uh, against uh, these uh, uh, objectives. And this is driving an interest in data-driven optimization. I mean, the focus on UNSUB recently been very interesting in relation to journal literature, um, but there's a range of uh, approaches to thinking about how you supply data that supports making decisions about collections. And uh, LCLC uh, provides uh, some uh, here as well. But this will become much more important, I think, space um, because of the decisions that libraries need to make. Finally, uh, pluralizing. Uh, libraries are pluralizing collections, services, and perspectives. So that all the communities they serve recognize uh, their own knowledges, experiences, voices, and memories in library services. And, and this has really come uh, as a, a very important uh, issue for, for many libraries. Clearly, if you think about Australia, if you think about New Zealand, if you think about Canada, and there has recently uh, and for some time been a big focus on indigenous peoples and uh, recognition as uh, various national initiatives have taken place that at the library level uh, really need to think about um, pluralizing, think about plural knowledges, experiences, voices, that people need to be able to recognize themselves, their identity in uh, uh, these services that they get. So. Uh, certainly, uh, quite a bit of focus on thinking about how you decenter dominant perspectives and give a, a voice and a name um, to uh, uh, communities, collections, experiences that may have been uh, overlooked, deliberately excluded, uh, marginalized. A couple of examples. Uh, the top one is Goldsmiths. Uh, quite like it, this actually precedes uh, the current. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter um, um, uh, moment, uh, although Keir Starmer, I think, got into trouble for saying moment, but the, uh, the, the current uh, situation, but looking at um, um, uh, decentering whiteness. I, I put this up, my, my daughter is a student at, at Goldsmith, so I, I, I was looking at this. 
but you know, looking at liberating the curriculum, looking at um, decentering whiteness, looking at diversifying the collection. Uh, the uh, picture on the bottom is from Vancouver Public Library, but if you look at uh, public libraries in Canada or all libraries in Canada, many of them, perhaps the majority of them will have a statement about um, uh, support for Indigenous peoples or, or how they are thinking about um, um, shifting uh, perspectives and collections. So uh, we are certainly thinking about uh, reckoning um, um, university libraries, uh, librarians, collections, services, really thinking about how to respond to this uh, awakening uh, or, or this uh, reckoning. I put up this example from the University of North Carolina where they are, um, uh, they have a text mining uh, uh, project uh, with the goal of discovering Jim, Jim Crow and racially biased legislation signed into law in North Carolina. So it's not just in the in the print collections and the whatever. Um, I, I, I put this in because of the focus in the digital um, uh, manifesto as well on programmatic, on computational analysis of collections. So thinking about thinking about this across the range of um, of collections. Thinking about how do we um, um, uh, diversify, pluralize uh, perspectives, and how does that uh, manifest itself in collections, so that the experiences, the memories, the identities of all our communities are represented and they can see themselves and find themselves and um, uh, be, be represented uh, there. Clearly, uh, quite a lot of uh, discussion about this in, in various uh, contexts. I, um, I put up the picture on the right because it's unusual to see reading lists mentioned in the, in the national uh, newspapers. And then uh, speaking of reading lists, you know, quite an interesting document uh, on the left looking at uh, decolonizing uh, reading lists. So uh, uh, strong focus emerging as an imperative, optimizing, pluralizing, and pluralizing one of the ways in which people want to uh, optimize. Okay, so um, I've spoken a little bit about some pandemic effects, spoken a little bit about how those three collection directions are being accelerated. And then how these two imperatives are emerging around optimizing and pluralizing collections. Um, and uh, really um, uh, a, a lot going on. And as I say, I think, um, I think more than we realize in some ways that the relationship of the library to the collection has changed. The collection has sort of been peeled away in a sense. And what we're looking at is a range of services to satisfy uh, needs part of which is the existing collection, but it can also be satisfied in, in many, many other, many other ways. So uh, thank you very much for that, and i um, happy to have some discussion or, or take some questions. Um, what we might do, if we can, is just bring up the poll again to see uh, where it, where it uh, uh, finished off, and I'll, I'll pass back to Robin. Thank you, Larkin. That's <laughs> Yet again, <laughs> a, a masterpiece in terms of the, the the direction, the depth, and the breadth of what you've covered. Fantastic! Again, capturing the connectivity between separate contexts and demonstrating the significance for the sector, and also flagging a direction of travel for us. And uh, wonderful! And there's much food for thought here. And uh, I think we've got um, a range of questions that reflect that. Um, uh, if you're able to work through them, I'll um, I'll I'll pick off a few, and um, uh, hopefully we'll have time to deal with most of them. Um, okay. Did well, you want to make a comment? Well. Any comment on the uh, uh, on the poll first? I don't think it's changed particularly. Well, I I I think um, I I think the shape is still very similar to before. Maybe the plural voices has come up a little bit. Um, uh, value for money uh, gone down. I, I, I still think, you know, obviously support for curriculum very important, and then openness re reflecting, reflecting, you know, a, a, a very important um, a policy and uh, practical consideration in, you know, library discussions. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, perhaps I could start with um, uh, almost an existential question. <laughs> Um, there was a, a debate some time ago about the library as, as, as the term 
and uh, the people moving away from that. And this is sort of connected in a sense. At what point do we start describing libraries as knowledge ecosystems, moving away from the traditional books in a room to a series of interlinked knowledge and re research repositories? Huh. <laughs> I, um, I feel like I'm in an interview. I am. Um, uh, I, I just declare that I think uh, library is a strong and powerful word and uh, that we should not uh, leave it behind. Um, I, uh, it does go to what I tried to say at the beginning though. I think the value, the identity and the workflow um, that, that we sometimes struggle with a perception of the library that is bound up with a, a researcher's undergraduate experience or you know, it's very difficult to communicate the full array of uh, what the library does in a snappy way. So what we end up with is we're, we're prey to certain stereotypes or whatever. I, I think library though is a, is a powerful word and uh, we, sh we should try and develop a richer library story and, and keep it. Then some of the other things that you're talking about can come in as facets or aspects of that. The issue we have, I suppose, with library at the moment is, you know, it's uh, we don't have a strong elevator pitch, or you know, as I said uh, recently, you you have to be in a very tall building uh, for the elevator pitch to work. Um, Absolutely. But I I think it would be I think it would be a mistake to let library go as as a word. Yes, I totally agree with you that in, in that respect. It's the it's that concept of interlinked repositories. I think was quite an in, interesting in that context. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a number of questions talking about effectively the external environment and publishers, um, uh, a, a sort of control and influence on the library systems and and, and development as well. So. It, are there ways in which we can, uh, as it were, influence that external world, and, uh, as it were, and make the library direction the direction that, 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 that that's the powerful one? Yeah, I, I, I mean, this presumably a uh, discussion about um, open access and the journal literature largely, um, where I, I should say up front I spend um, less time. I am very struck by those discussions about the different positions that, that people come into it and even different commentators, you know, that uh, some people see journal publishing as a business and think about business drivers, incentives and, and so on. And, and it's obvious that um, at various of the larger publishers will move to open access publishing models in the context of um, being able to uh, preserve certain uh, revenue or margin. But the, um, um, uh, if you think about the, the library uh, group, um, you know, certain funders would think about it more as a rational, de uh, rational system that we need to design in various ways. But the part of the issue is then it's populated by these commercial entities who are driven um, to behave in certain ways. And then clearly uh, scholars, researchers and so on, who, and there's no unified view uh, coming, coming from them, but very invested in the prestige economy, very invested in, in that reputation um, system. So it seems to me it's very complicated because you've got all of these different uh, pieces uh, in play and different, um, different practices and expectations uh, across uh, all of them. However, when you do step back and you look at what's happened over the last while, I think it, it, it is really very interesting to see the changes that have happened. Now, are they the, the right changes? You know, a lot of discussion while well, moving to um, moving to uh, APCs, moving to gold, you know, how, what are we really changing in terms of the, the, the balance, um, the, um, um, uh, you know, how, how successful, you know, is green, um, discussions about transformational agreements, pro or con, you know, and you, you know, you're, you're, you know, very familiar with all, all, all of that. So it seems to me there is no silver bullet. There is no uh, clear answer here. I think from a library point of view, what the library should be doing is 
advocating for the interests of the constituency they represent, which is the university and the individual researchers, and uh, continue to do that, which I, I think they have done quite effectively, acknowledging that it is this very uh, complicated, um, complicated uh, system. Mm. So um, it's uh, you know it's a it's a really interesting environment with all of this activity going on, but I think that I, I don't think there's a single uh, response or, or, or answer there, which I think is, is really where perhaps you and your colleagues are uh, or have landed. Yeah. Yes, I think that, that, that's right. And that, I mean, you talked, I think you mentioned harnessing, and I, I've been quite struck by the way that um, the academic communities have been harnessed to, in, um, in negotiations. You see with UCLA, for example, and <clears throat> is there more we can do in that sort of arena? Yeah, I think there. I think there's definitely an educational um, issue on campuses in terms of explaining the dynamic of the publishing uh, environment and explaining. So, if you think about you know what the bigger publishers are um, doing. Uh, you know, the move into university analytics, research analytics, um, you know, um, uh, uh, services there, moving into uh, researcher workflow. I mean, it's quite interesting looking at the acquisitions that Elsevier has made over the last um, 10 years or so. And I'm sure you've, you've, you've analyzed these where you can see where you have the services that are targeted at libraries in terms of buying bibliographic services, buying electronic journals. But then now you've got this huge suite of services that are targeted at individual researchers in terms of, you know, Mendeley, SSRN, the, you know, range of things. And then you've got the services that are targeted at research administration in terms of the university analytics and, um, um, you know, the and something like Pure sitting in between, you know, where various people have a, have a stake. So what you have is this diversification into analytics and workflow um, to uh, uh, acknowledging, you know, that um, um, the publishing arm may be under a lot of pressure. How do you, how do you diversify in various ways and, and make those work together? So I think uh, education of um, uh, colleagues and so on about some of the dynamics of, of that uh, marketplace I mean, crucially, it comes back, I think, to the reputation management issue, and, and that's really very difficult because of the reliance on um, citations, impact factor, and so on, as the as the way. And, and you know, as we all know, people. I remember once um, talking to a colleague whose uh, husband was a researcher, and she said uh, they they came around some afternoon to uh, watch soccer uh, and compare their age factors, their uh, their age index, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that 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 sense of you know the the, the researcher competitiveness and the uh, the the measures and metrics that they use you know to look at that very much bound up with with that publishing system. So I think it's uh, I think it's a slow uh, process, but I think um, really making um, universities aware of the dynamics of that marketplace of of you know what's happening, of some of the consequences of investment in these systems. On the other hand, we don't have a parallel prestige management, reputation management system at the at the moment. No, no, indeed. Thank you. So, sh shifting directions slightly here, um, you mentioned the um, move to open access, and, and there's a, a comment and a question, I guess. Is is, it, is OA globally the, the ultimate collective collection strategy? Huh. Well, I, I think um, you, you know you've got multiple strands. Uh, as I say, uh, I, I, I um, you know because of uh, OCLC's range of involvements and my my background, I don't spend as much time on the journal side. Um, I think uh, if you think about the uh, uh, mono monograph literature, you know books, uh, clearly OA much uh, much slower there. Um, I think we are seeing uh, collective collection on the journal literature emerge much more strongly. 
Um, and, you know, OA is part of that. But even if you think about what people do, how people search for things, I mean, Google Scholar is the ultimate collective collection, uh, and it, you know, pulls together things. And you look at the other, you know, the other search engines in, in this space, you know, the, the one from the Allen Institute or, um, you know, Meta, um, Microsoft Academic Search, they all trail behind um, um, uh, Google uh, uh, Scholar. But when you think about access to the, access to the literature you have, uh, you, you have that there, which is uh, heavily used, and they do a reasonable job of trying to point to uh, open access services. So I think, uh, I think that is true on the um, um, journal side. When you, when you combine that with, uh, if you've configured your knowledge base, if you're in an individual institution, you actually do have access to quite a wide range of things, but they aren't available to the uh, public, of course. Um, on the book side, I think it is quite interesting. I think we will see some effort to consolidate and bring into shared management more print, more print collections just because of if they're releasing progressively less value, the opportunity cost goes up because needing to use the space and so on. And, um, you know, this, the, the general shift. Um, and then you get into, you know, do you digitize? Um, so I think the future of HashiTrust is re really very interesting. Does HashiTrust remain where it is? Does it develop into much more of a global resource? I don't think there are any UK members at the moment of the HashiTrust, but you know, for that collective collection to work, you have to, it's very difficult to do it in a distributed way, you know, so um, you know, should there be a, a shared initiative looking at becoming part of uh, HashiTrust and the contact? But then you run into all of the uh, licensing issues. And I think control digital lending in that context is, is going to be a very uh, interesting discussion over the next couple of years. And certainly, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's going to be some uh, court attention in, in the context of uh, decisions there. Yes, uh, indeed. Oh. Do you think we we can change the copyright laws, the policies in that regard? That's certainly a big issue. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know, as I as I said in a throwaway remark, I mean, I think the reevaluating rights where that where that where that line is, I mean, will be decided. Um, you know, that there'll have to be sort of lobbying and so on. It's, uh, Control digital lending, I think, is is quite interesting. It, it requires infrastructure to support its operation, though, um, and then um, you know moving that forward. I think that is an area where the UK, with that national layer of attention from JISC and related things, has a certain advantage in some ways because there's, there's the opportunity to concentrate attention and focus. Um, however, what what it means maybe is you know, there has to be more, I, I would say that the university librarians or others maybe should um, think about it more instrumentally. You know, what do we want to see and try and push those things uh, through, acknowledging that influence and so on is, is diffuse or, or difficult. But um, um, I, I think generally, I mean, that's one of the things I was going to say. I think, um, you know, we're seeing it here in the US, I think, uh, if you think about coming out of this, you know, there really are some things where, you know, the, the, uh, people are going to take a, a clearer or a stronger view. And I think advancing those requires people to be more instrumental in terms of the agencies available to them to affect change. And I think you can see that maybe in, in the U.S. context, the consortia will be under you know, the, the libraries will come into the consortia saying we need to do this, this, and this. But similarly, it seems to me that you have capacity, shared capacity to, to move things along. So, um, you know, re, re, really sort of thinking about what is important in that context, that, that's difficult because of the collective action issue, you know, can, 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 you, can you all agree? And then can you agree to change things in, in, for, the, for, the, for the general good, which is always a, a difficult thing. But, but it does seem to me that the agency question is very important, and if you have agency you have a you have a body some, some somewhere where you can pool your influence pool your decision making 
uh, pools, some other things, then it's a matter, though, of uh, harnessing that to, to, to move things forward. Just returning to the collective collection for a, a bit briefly, do you think that an approach, a collective collection approach to digitization would work for special and archival collections? You know, thinking about funding, selection, delivery, access, and so on. Yeah, I, I mean, in some ways, uh, it's it's been surprising that we haven't seen a little bit more attention to this. Clearly, you've got because uh, I think a, a lot of it depends on aggregation because you need to be able to discover the stuff and then request it. Uh, clearly, you 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 have you've had the DPLA in um, in um, the U.S. You've got Europeana, which you know it's, it's, it's some political motivation at the at the beginning. Um, you know, you've had various, you know, national initiatives around digitization. I know that our UK has, has been involved in the sort of looking at how to um, um, develop, a, a, as it were, a registry of digital uh, copies. I mean, because you, you very much, uh, it comes back to the decision support as well. You, you want to digitize things that are maybe rare or have not been digitized already. And uh, it's difficult at the moment to find out whether something is rare or hasn't been digitized already. So there's a there's an infrastructure issue there. And I think as the report pointed out, you know, OCLC has uh, a part there, but 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 um, um, you know it, the the um, it's, it's more potential than actual. The um, I think um, it, it does depend on on services coming together to allow you to discover and, and find stuff. Um, Doing it, you know, in, in a very distributed way is difficult. I mean, if you're Cambridge and you have Newton and Darwin, then you have gravitational pull and people will go to see Newton and Darwin. But there are very few Cambridges. <laughs> um, so um, um, pulling it together. Now, why hasn't it happened? I think it hasn't happened because, um, uh, number one, of money even though from a library point of view, there's a view that this is very important, uh, these are our treasures, the uh, resources haven't necessarily gone into that area to, um, you know, to build it up to, to make it important from a systems point of view and an aggregation point of view. So I think there's a, an issue there. I think there's also an issue on the demand side, on the research side. If you think about the uh, monograph literature, the book literature, or if you think about the journal literature, you can actually assemble something that's that will satisfy most researchers, most learners. You know that um, if you if you if you think about your discovery layer, you know you you or if you think about Google Scholar, you know you've 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 got a pretty good coverage of the research literature. You've got pretty good coverage of the book literature. Um, however, when it comes to special collections. If I'm a if if I if I want to use special collections in my teaching, then I don't need it to be comprehensive, uh, and I can you know using Omeka, using whatever, I can build sort of nice learning resources on top of what what I can currently find or what I can currently uh, look at, and, and there's actually some quite interesting stuff um, along those lines. If I'm a researcher, though, I need I need comprehensiveness. I need I need to feel that I have prospected what's available in a particular area, or I have um, signposts to where I I need to go. And we don't have that comprehensiveness on on that side. And something like European or DPLA certainly doesn't, because it's really um, based on you know what people have sent to it. So you know no. Um, um, no offense, as you know, my children would say, it's 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 a bit random because it's um, you know it's coming from it's coming from from different directions. Now there are some initiatives. We're 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 part of a project at the moment called NAFAN, a National uh, um, Archival Finding uh, National. I should know it. National uh, Merrily. What does NAFAN stand for? Um, uh, so it's a finding, finding aid. Finding aid archival network. Yes. I was looking for a second A, but it's in national. So national finding a uh, national finding aid archival network. So what you have there is uh, an exploration of uh, an aggregation to allow you to find finding aids because you know there's a recognition that for this to be effective, you really need to have a 
a large mass of material because from the researcher point of view there needs to be some 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 feeling that they're prospecting a reasonably comprehensive resource yeah. and I suppose in that context what what impact do you think machine learning artificial intelligence might have in the, in this area and also beyond I think um, I think machine learning and artificial intelligence are accelerants rather than um, things that make a make a major change. The the um, they have to operate on stuff. Um, so I think uh, I think we can look to them um, as accelerants. Um, you know, if we, if we assemble um, uh, digitized material, if we um, um, do bring various things together, then we can add quite a bit of value maybe through machine learning. We can prospect them in various ways. So uh, I, I think they um, ac accelerate um, potentially uh, what we can do with those, but they themselves aren't going to create the foundation or the infrastructure that allows us to assemble that material in the first place or decide what gets done. I mean, I should point out, and, and we're very aware of this now, and certainly going back to the pluralizing question, um, we're, we're very aware of the uh, fact that machine learning, artificial intelligence are as good as the, as the data sets that they're given to learn on and to train. And, you know, the, the uh, various examples around facial recognition, um, 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 the, the, the ways in which uh, uh, algorithmic um, choices, uh, um, you know, outputs are influenced by uh, the data that they're working on, some of the decisions that are made, all, all of those things have become very much scrutinized of late. So I think some of the, some of the um, strong um, uh, support for those appro uh, approaches has become um, moderated by a recognition that um, uh, we really need to be careful about um, the data that they're working on, the results that they're producing. We don't want, um, you know, distorted um, or, or, or strange results. Thank you, Locke, and that, that's yeah. really interesting. Um, I, you know, I, we, we're coming almost to the end, I think, in, in, in terms of probably your energy. <laughs> but um, I, I I was wondering, there's a question about, you started off with talking about the uh, differences between the UK and US and so on. I, I, there's a question about the, the libraries moving to support research, education or engagement and away from the collections based libraries. I wonder if that's perhaps a more US focused than UK. Um, it's been part of UK academic library strategy for a few years now. Yeah. Um, Maybe. Maybe, I, I, and, and maybe I phrased it wrongly. I, I, what, what I'm thinking is that if you think about, uh, you know, your strategy document or your, um, some years ago, you would have sort of talked about, we provide access to information to make the universe a better place. We, we build collections to make them. And you still do that, and that's very important. And the collection is still central. I didn't mean to suggest that the collection wasn't a central activity of what the library does. However, now, what you what, what libraries will tend to do is to say we support the we support student success and retention in the following ways. We support research productivity in the following ways, and then the collection is one of the services that actually does that in 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 various ways. Uh, rather than starting with you know um, uh, the library, what's the library? Library the library the library uh, provides access to information so that the campus is whatever. I think. Now, what you'd probably say is the library supports research and learning by doing this, this, and this, and the collection is a very important part of that. So I think it's more, a, I think it's, a, I think it's more an emphasis thing on one side. The other side is I think that our notion of collections has um, uh, quite, is quite elastic. So, so if you think even if think about something very specific like demand-driven acquisition. Um, or then just think about resource guides. Think about the huge effort um, that's gone into pointing people at uh, resources elsewhere. Um, you know, if you think about all of the resource guides, we don't normally think about those as collecting, but, but I mean, effectively, they're doing what collections are doing. They're trying to satisfy the, the needs of um, 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 students, uh, largely. I, I remember when... Um, 
um, went to um, an uh, uh, introduction session for my son when he was going to university and I, I turned up at the library session and, uh, and, um, and acknowledging this is a US institution. They, they did it all based on a resource guide. You know, the, um, so I, 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 think it's, uh, I think maybe it's a, a nuance, but the, the collection is central to what the library does but you don't hang the library story on access to information and collection. You ha you, the library story is about supporting research and learning and the collection is a service that does valuable work there. But you also do various other information management, information access, delivery types of things to support that that complement the collection. And I think it depends on the institution as well. I mean, if I'm going back to Cambridge, if I'm Cambridge with Darwin and Newton and, and these big collections, I have a slightly different view of collections than if I'm a more learning oriented institution. Um, uh, and it's, you know, people are excellent in different ways. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, I guess we come to almost the end, the last question perhaps. Uh, and we return to that to our users, um, which is quite, quite a nice way to end. I, I, I'll, I'll read the question out, which is Virginia Will said that um, today the one needs a space of one's own. How do we support our users who want to map their own space in the collaborative library space and share their discoveries? Interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. I think the whole the whole question about space is is, is really uh, very interesting um, as we as we um, as we move forward. And I think again it, it will depend on the uh, on the institution. Um, I think the management of shared spaces, thinking about engagement in spaces, all of the types of things that have happened over the last few years, will continue to be important. But there's going to be this public health layer imposed on everything, which you know, is, 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 is going to um, really, I think, um, change, um, you know, that and, we, and we, we don't know when the new normal is or, or when that's going to happen. That said, I think that sense of certainly in the, the, the residential model that's, that's still a large part of, of, of what the universities do, that sense of um, um, a, a place uh, uh, a place to go, a place to consult, a place where you're not observed, a, a, a place to get your work done, a place to meet colleagues, a place to consult specialist expertise, a, a place where you potentially have, you know, equipment or resources available to you. Uh, uh, all of that uh, remains uh, very important from a, an engagement, from a uh, mental health, from a uh, uh, retention, a success, all, all, all of those things, you know, re, re, really important. The impact of that public health layer, I think, you know, we, we've, we've, we've yet to see. It's, it's one of the things, you know, going to have to work through in terms of, you know, the social distancing, uh, wiping down surfaces, barriers between people, all, all of that that I'm sure you're, you're, you're very much um, immersed in. I do think um, that the um, the issue, clearly, there's major issues for students working at home. Um, um, uh, you know, just given the, the uh, equity, equity issues, the, the divides that this has thrown up in terms of access to equipment, access to broadband, access to space, to the Virginia Woolf uh, issue, that, you know, space is a, a luxury commodity in the context of, you know, it's, if you if you are in a big house, if you have a, um, you know you, you you have access to that space, you know uh, presence of children. I think the various studies showing that, um, um, uh, showing um, uh, publication rates. You know how now with uh, uh, researchers being at home, um, um, uh, proportion of publications by women has dropped because the domestic burden, the children burden, is stronger. Uh, on them now than, than it was, but maybe overall. So you've got all of these, you know, fa factors uh, at play. Um, I think part of it goes back to that sense of engagement and the relational thing that uh, universities are going to have to rethink how they connect 
uh, with uh, with various people, how they develop relations. And I think from a library point of view, that's also uh, quite important. Clearly, there's a scale issue there then because you can't you know reach everybody. I'm very struck by the fact, and you know this is a tangent. Various public libraries now do comfort calls. They they call people that are uh, on their own or uh, that they know uh, have some issues. And, and it's just because they, they recognize that previously those people did spend some time in the library, maybe came into the library, and, and you know, that they might welcome a, a human contact, human touch, human, human connection. So I think there is a real um, challenge in terms of how you uh, think about in the context of a shift to digital or a shift to this more holistic uh, library context where you have to provide more of what you do through that, um, how, you, how you achieve that sense of connection, engagement, uh, the relational ties that are uh, quite important. My um, colleague, Lynn Conway, a few years ago did some work on virtual reference where one of the reasons students uh, weren't using virtual reference as much as uh, people thought was they didn't want to have an interaction with somebody anonymous even though it was a librarian, even though it was a secure place, even though they felt that you, you make a connection with somebody and then you, you do things. But without that connection, you, they, they didn't do the results. So I, I, I think um, you know, this is a general challenge for um, universities and, and for libraries um, within that. Thank you, Mark. And we must finish there. And I realize my enthusiasm has let me run over time, both, both my yours and the audiences. <laughs> so thank you. Wonderful, thought provoking, productive session, and a great beginning to our series of digital shift forum events.